The second generation Peugeot 308 SW is a rarity. A compact estate car that not only looks good, but is really practical too. There's no seven seat option this time round, but otherwise, unless you come in search of cutting edge dynamics, this model is hard to fault, thanks to a classy interior, a comfortable ride, some excellent efficiency numbers, and most importantly of all, enough space in the boot to embarrass every other rival in this segment. I've always struggled a little with the concept of a small estate car. After all, most people buy an estate in search of space and versatility, both tough briefs to meet if the model in question is in any way compact. Though not in this case, not with this car, Peugeot's second generation 308 SW. Here's proof positive that it isn't how big your car is that matters, it's how cleverly it's been designed for interior use of the space that it has. Let me show you what I mean. This 308 SW measures in at just under 4.6 metres, but offers up to 1,660 litres of space. The brand's larger 508 SW, in contrast, measuring in at around 4.8 metres, has 1,598 litres of space. You can see the point. Nor is this 308 SW merely able to embarrass its larger stablemate. Its carriage capacity routinely overshadows that of many other apparently much larger estate models, all of which is at least some compensation for the fact that, rather surprisingly, in view of the size advantages I've just been talking about, this car lacks the unique selling point that characterised both of its direct predecessors, namely the optional provision of a third seating row for potential seven-seat capacity. The lack of that feature has certainly reduced the necessity for the designers to make this car so boxy this time round. Most estate buyers these days seem to be looking for swoopier, more stylish shapes, a demand this Peugeot now seems better set to meet. It promises to satisfy on other levels too, primarily in offering the segment's most efficient range of engines. It's also affordable, cleverly high-tech and attractively priced. So where's the catch? That's what we're here to find out. Peugeot's engineers set out to make the driving experience offered up by this 308 SW model as similar as possible to that of the hatchback variant it's based upon. And by and large it is. Despite the necessary suspension tweaks made to cope with the extra weight this car may have to carry. And we're not talking anything overtly sporty here, despite suggestions you get to the contrary from the small, low-set steering wheel that you must look over the top of to see the smartly styled instrument cluster. This layout is now an established brand trademark, and it all works much better than it did when the French designers first tried it in the smaller 208 Super Mini, more of the instruments now being visible. Those who remember the old 307 SW won't be left with that feeling of being perched on a bar stool, while folk trading up from the original 308 SW model will appreciate better visibility and comfier seats. In fact, this car is comfier all round, and initial impressions are that its driving experience has been tuned to suit. Certainly over the first few miles, the slightly vague Electrically assisted steering and supple suspension lull you into thinking that this Peugeot is a bit of a confection from the sweet trolley. Surprisingly though, if you can summon up the confidence to drive this car a bit harder, you'll find that it can really up its game, helped by better body rigidity and a centre of gravity 20 millimetres lower than that of the old model. Yes, the curious driving position with its wheel positioned down towards your lap does seem a little strange at first, but you quickly adjust as pesky roundabouts become wrist flick chicanes. Ultimately, over fast flowing roads, there's grip and feedback that can begin to approach that of the better handling cars in this segment. Models like the Honda Civic Tourer, the Seat Leon ST and the Ford Focus Estate. Is a Focus that bit more responsive? Probably. 
After all, this Peugeot lacks the kind of torque vectoring system that helps the Ford get its power down through the corners. But thanks in part to the stiffness of its high-tech EMP2 platform and tenacious front-end traction, this 308 isn't as far off the class leader as some of the magazines would have you believe. And it's probably a better choice if you prioritise ride quality. That's surprised me a little. The Focus, after all, has a better technical CV with fancy multi-link rear suspension that, over bumpier services, ought to set its streets ahead of this Peugeot's simpler twist-beam rear axle setup. In the event, the 308 more than holds its own with a supple ride quality that's upset only by the largest potholes you'll meet when cruising around town, a place where you'll appreciate the tighter 11.2 metre turning circle. The steering response feels good at those kinds of speeds, which is some compensation for the slight lack of feel you get when you're cornering a little more quickly. Less impressive than the ride and handling balance is the gear shift quality. Feebler engines get five speed manual boxes, while the more modern units get six ratios. Either way, the whole cog swapping process could be more precise. For those preferring not to attempt it, there's the option further up the range of a redeveloped six-speed auto that's supposed to make up in smoothness what it lacks in fancy twin-clutch technology. You get a six-speed manual transmission in the variant that'll probably be the UK's strongest seller, the 115 brake horsepower 1.6 litre EHDI diesel. It's only a few hundred pounds more than the base 92 brake horsepower 1.6 litre HDI diesel starter model, but offers a useful extra turn of speed, 0 to 62 miles an hour in 12 and a half seconds en route to 117 miles an hour, without any real running cost penalty thanks to the sixth gear ratio and stop and start system that you get as part of the EHDI package. The future of diesel motoring, though, lies beyond these engines, with Peugeot's pricier Euro 6 compatible Blue HDI technology, which is at its most efficient in the 120 brake horsepower, 1.6 litre form I'm trying here. As you might expect, the performance is very similar to that of the old tech 1.6 litre EHDI variant I just mentioned, but the efficiency returns are in a different league that no eco-minded diesel rival can match. I should also mention that you can also go blue HDI 308 SW motoring in Pokia 2 litre 150 brake horsepower form, but the on-paper performance advantages are tiny and the running costs are much higher, so unless you really need the extra torque for towing or something, I'd save you money. Top of the diesel range is the sportier 2 litre blue HDI 180 GT model. This offers a pricey but tempting balance of power and parsimony, able to sprint to 62 miles an hour in 8.6 seconds, en route to 135 miles an hour, yet potentially capable of averaging nearly 70 miles to the gallon. On to petrol power. To be frank, it's refreshing to find a car in this class that can still offer a truly credible and realistically priced petrol engine option these days. But you'll find one here in the willing Revy Little 1.2 litre ETHP units, these being some of the best petrol power plants you can buy in this entire segment of the market. The ETHP unit may only offer three cylinders, but it punches well above its weight, whether you choose it in five-speed 110 brake horsepower or six-speed 130 brake horsepower guise. The far more affordable and slightly more economic lower-powered version is the one to choose, offering a 13.6 second 0-62 mile an hour sprint time, just a second slower than its Pokia stablemate, and a 117 mile an hour top speed that's only a fraction behind. Either way, the addition of a balance shaft to reduce vibration certainly makes this three-cylinder engine significantly quieter than Ford's equivalent one-litre EcoBoost unit. For properly serious outright performance though, you'll need quite a bit more capacity up front, which you'll find in the petrol GT model, which gets a 1.6 litre THP turbo unit. This develops 205 brake horsepower, a remarkable power to weight ratio, and a prodigious 285 newton meters of torque. This top variant comes as standard with the driver sport pack, you'll find is available at extra cost further down the range. At the press of a button, this option can firm up the steering, 
touch up on the throttle response and introduce a sportier engine note created via a digital amplifier and broadcast through the stereo speakers. It also turns the instrument dials red and brings up a digital display showing engine characteristics or a g-force meter just in case you want to take the scenic route back from the supermarket. An estate car ought to be properly bigger than the family hatchback it will usually have been derived from. The fact that so few of the smaller ones are is down to laziness and cost cutting that usually sees estate versions of focus sized models sharing exactly the same wheelbase and underpinnings as their hatchback counterparts. When it came to this 308 SW though, Peugeot did the job properly thanks to a light, rigid EMP2 platform that enabled them to give this car a wheelbase 110 millimetres longer than that of the ordinary hatch. The rear overhang is 220 millimetres longer too. Up front, this car is of course identical to any other 308, which means a sculpted bonnet with distinctive swage lines that flow into sharky headlamps, offering LED lights on plusher versions like this one. The overall effect is a look that's confident, yet modern and restrained, which is exactly what you'd need if you were trying to push your company up market a bit. In the lower area of the front bumper, a wide air intake is framed by fog lamps that incorporate directional indicators and are set into a C-shaped chromed surround. In profile, you notice the extra 332 millimetres of length this SW model boasts over its hatchback counterpart, along with a gradual roofline drop from front to rear that gives this car a more stylish look than its predecessor, though at the expense of the thing that really marked the first generation 308 SW out in the compact estate market segment. Namely, the way that car could offer a fold-out third seating row that families often found invaluable when extra kids were invited home for tea. I'm disappointed that this second generation model no longer offers this feature, but I can't deny that the change has indeed made it more attractive. The stretched, slender look highlighted by a bright chrome window finisher that surrounds the entire glazed area and gives the design a more sophisticated feel. Especially here at the rear end, where tail lamps flow from the sides, as on the hatchback model, creating a striking and contemporary signature through the use of up to 48 LEDs, if you choose that option. So you've got the idea then. It's all about style at the expense of space. Except that it isn't. Lift the rather heavy plastic tailgate. It's a pity there's no option for merely lifting the glass to put in smaller bags and the wide aperture reveals the largest loading bay in the class, the 660 litre cargo bay, 30 to 40% bigger than that offered by some direct competitors. There's nearly 200 litres more room here, for example, than you'd find in a rival Ford Focus estate. In fact, slightly embarrassingly for Peugeot, this loading area is so large that it easily eclipses that of the brand's supposedly much bigger 508 SW estate, which must be awkward for salespeople to have to explain in the showroom. Ultimately, the bottom line here is that you're getting a medium range Mondeo sized estate car for the price of a compact focus sized one. And that's a good deal in anyone's book. It's a very usable space too. The loading sill height is amongst the lowest you'll find on any estate car. And the cargo area itself has vertical side walls with minimal wheel arch intrusion. Around 70 litres of the carriage capacity can be found under the boot floor, which is also where you can neatly store away the rear parcel shelf when not in use. There's room here too for uh, removable lashing hooks that can be used to tether up packages that might otherwise slide forward under braking. Now in dealing with such awkward loads you'll also be aided by these floor rails. They're so that extra cost features like a cargo net or movable dividers can be attached to keep your luggage in place. What else? Well you get a 12 volt socket back here 
but it's a pity that it's been mounted above parcel shelf level, which looks unsightly if you've something plugged in with the cover closed up. I do, though, like the standard inclusion of a ski hatch so that longer items can be poked through without disturbing rear seat folk. And it's useful that there are plastic pockets at the side of the boot that can be removed uh, to make it easier to load in wide objects. Smaller items, meanwhile, can be secured by an elastic strap on the left-hand side trim. And just above that, you'll find one of the levers for the clever Magic Flat seat folding system. The magic bit refers to the way that the rear seat backs don't just flop onto the seat bases, as would be the case with some rivals. That would create an upward incline in the flattened cargo area floor. To avoid that in this 308 SW, the seat bases move forward and down slightly as you pull that magic flat lever. And sure enough, as a result, you do get a remarkably flat loading bay with a class leading 1,660 litres of space, or theoretically up to 1,775 litres if you load right up to the roof. A little disappointingly though, you can't extend the luggage area with the kind of fold forward front passenger seat that some rivals offer as an option. That means surfboards and the like will need to go on the roof, so it's just as well that roof rails are standard across the range. Now, I mentioned earlier, that Peugeot had extended the wheelbase of the basic 308 design to create this car. And one of the other advantages of that is that the slightly cramped standards of rear seat passenger room that you get in the hatchback version are here much improved. The longer wheelbase means that these rear doors can open much wider. And the seats inside are positioned a little further back, so it'll be slightly easier for parents to install booster cushions and the like. Once you do take a seat back here, the 29 millimetres of extra legroom on offer is certainly welcome, but it still doesn't make this car the most spacious contender in this segment. As usual in a car of this class, there's reasonable space for two adults, but three will be cramped unless they're of school age. Specify your car with the full length 1.6 square meter panoramic glass roof, and there's the bonus of an airy feeling atmosphere. But the downside is the way that the arrangement robs taller passengers of those last few millimeters of headroom. Take a place in one of the very comfortable seats up front in what Peugeot rather pretentiously calls the eye cockpit, and four things are immediately apparent. Quality, lack of button clutter, uh, the big center dash LCD infotainment screen, and most notably the tiny steering wheel above which, rather than through which, you're supposed to view the instruments with their finely sculpted red needles. Let's start with that, part of an arrangement first seen on the smaller 208 Super Mini, but more effectively delivered here because it's easier to see the high-mounted dial pack above the wheel rim. Yes, it's a bit of a culture shock. Yes, you'll eventually get to like it. Yes, you should ignore whinging journalists who don't. With that issue out of the way, you can start to look around the cabin and try and appreciate what Peugeot has tried to do with the interior of this 308. With the possible exception of the rather incongruous looking oversized gear knob, it's all very nice indeed, with lovely touches like the Aston Martin style contra rotating rev counter. Plenty of soft touch plastics and cool chrome finishes mean that the quality is certainly a cut above what you'd expect from a model priced against rivals from Ford, Vauxhall, Toyota and Renault. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by that. After all, Peugeot owns the company Forissia that uh, produces many of the premium quality interior furnishings that you get in posh German cars. Jump into this model after familiarisation with, say, an Astra or Focus estate rival, and you'll wonder where all the buttons have gone. There's a small central cluster of them in front of the gear stick for locking, demisting, hazard warning lights, heated rear window and air recirculation, and that's about it. 
Otherwise, everything's been relocated to the 9.7 inch color LCD touchscreen that's standard on all but baseline models and dominates the center of the dash. Whether you think that this is a good thing will depend on your point of view. The functions aren't as immediately intuitive as the usual knobs and dials, of course, and personally, I'd have separated the ventilation controls back out onto the dash. It's a bit annoying, after all, to have to switch screens and jab away at a touchscreen every time you want to tweak the fan or alter the cabin temperature. Having said that, the setup works well once you're used to it, featuring sat-nav as standard, along with access to vehicle settings, Bluetooth phone functions, a stereo system which could include a 6.9 gigabyte jukebox as well as a photo viewer and various optional driving aids, plus a selection of downloadable Peugeot Connect apps. To activate and select from these, you'll need to pay an annual subscription, which gets you a so-called plug and play 3G key that slots into the USB port. You'll then be able to get yourself apps telling you everything from the nearest parking space to traffic information, weather and tourist tips. The Coyote app's worth downloading too, a crowdsourced warning system that briefs you on highway holdups, danger points and speed traps already encountered by over two million other road users. That only leaves cabin practicalities. The 12 litre glove box is compromised on right hand drive cars by this huge fuse box. But you do get door bins that can take a large 1.5 litre water bottle and a centre console with a sliding cover, uh, revealing a cup holder which can be swivelled out of the way so that you can stash away wallets and phones. Plus there's a useful shelf directly in front of the gear stick that's ideal for iPods and MP3 players. Finally, I should mention the fact that above base trim level, you have to have an electric parking brake, not normally a feature I'm in favor of. This one though is automatic and disengages without requiring a push, which is a big plus in its favor. The 308 SW lineup ignores some of the equivalent hatchback models' older, cheaper, feebler engines. So the starting prices for the range might look a little higher. In fact, the premium for ownership of this estate variant is only around £700 in model for model comparisons with the hatch, which, for what is a completely revised design with a longer wheelbase, seems very fair. That means asking prices ranging mainly in the 17 to 23,000 pound bracket. As far as the range on offer is concerned, many buyers might well make the mistake of immediately opting for one of the lower order HDI diesel variants without first considering the merits of the 110 and 130 brake horsepower ETHP 1.2 litre petrol models. Now I think that would be a mistake. True, efficient though they are, the ETHP power plants are still 20% less economic than their 1.6 litre HDI diesel equivalents. But they're also less expensive to buy, more refined, offer more performance and run on cheaper fuel. If like me you're convinced by that then you'll probably find that the 110 brake horsepower 1.2 litre ETHP petrol model is the one to have as it offers quite a price saving on the pokier version is almost as fast and a bit more frugal too. And beyond the small capacity ETHP petrol offerings? Well, there are still a few buyers in this segment for whom petrol performance is everything. And for them, at the top of the range, there's a flagship GT model equipped with a potent 205 brake horsepower version of the 1.6 litre THP turbo unit Peugeot co-developed with BMW. For many though, diesel power will be a non-negotiable in this class of car. If that's your perspective in consideration of this 308 SW, then there are really two main choices you have to make. The least expensive option would be to go with one of Peugeot's cheaper but old-tech diesel engines, badged either 1.6 HDI 92 or 1.6 EHDI 115. 
find another 10 to 15 percent on top of the asking price required for those variants though and you can instead opt for one of the brand's cleaner and more economic blue HDI diesel models. Now I've got the 1.6 litre 120 brake horsepower blue HDI version here and I reckon those who can stretch to it will be getting the pick of the range. Yes, there's more performance on offer in the 150 and 180 brake horsepower 2 litre blue HDI models, but I don't think many buyers will need it. And of course, this 1.6 is far more economic and much cheaper to buy. So, having hopefully simplified the engine range for you, it's time to look at how this car stacks up as a value proposition against its compact estate segment rivals. Without going into too much detail, I'll give you a broad overview. By choosing, say, a Korean budget brand rival like Kia Seed SW or Hyundai's i30 Tourer, or by selecting, say, a Vauxhall Astra Sports Tourer or a Toyota Auris Touring Sports with what will probably be an older tech engine, you may be able to save yourself a little over this 308 SW, but in list price terms, you're not actually talking about that much. For an equivalent Ford Focus Estate or Honda Civic Tourer, you'll generally be looking at list pricing of a little more, uh, with something like a comparable Renault Megane Sport Tourer even more costly than that. Not as pricey though as an equivalent Volkswagen Golf Estate, for which you'll need two to three thousand pounds more, depending on the version that you're looking at. The car in this segment that most closely price matches this Peugeot is golf-based though, Seat's Leon ST. Though like every other competitor in this segment, that car has a significantly smaller boot. If, having considered all of that, you conclude that it is a 308 SW that you really want, then you're going to need to know exactly what will be included in terms of standard equipment. And the answer is a reasonable amount. Even the base access variant includes LED daytime running lights, roof rails, air conditioning, uh, cruise control with a speed limiter, a DAB digital radio, Bluetooth phone connectivity, and a USB connection. There's a proper space saver rear wheel too, which is far better than the kind of fiddly puncher repair kit that some rivals offer in an attempt to free up extra boot space. What base versions of this Peugeot lack though, apart from an alarm, which seems a bit mean, is the large 9.7 inch infotainment touchscreen with satellite navigation set up, fitted across all the other trim levels, a display that really completes the cabin of this car. For that, you have to buy in at an active spec level that as well as the sat nav, auto air conditioning and rear parking sensors you don't find on most comparably priced rivals, also gives you things like alloy wheels, a leather covered steering wheel and gear stick, plus auto headlamps and wipers. Further up the range on plusher models like this one, there are niceties like full LED headlamps, uh, bigger 17 inch alloy wheels a reverse parking camera, front fog lights and power folding mirrors. Niceties fitted either at the top of the lineup or available on the options list include keyless entry, a high-end Denon hi-fi system, a panoramic glass roof and stylish Alcantara or Napa leather trimmed seats that can be ordered with a massage function that's supposed to be soothing but I found isn't actually very effective. There's also the option of a park assist function to automatically steer you into the tightest spaces. And I'd also want to look at the driver sport pack, which at the press of a button can firm up the steering, sharpen the throttle response and introduce a sportier engine note created via a digital amplifier. Safety-wise, all models feature twin front, side and curtain airbags, plus all the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction and stability control to hopefully ensure that they'll never be needed. All of which justifies a five-star Euro NCAP safety test showing. Optional across the range is a blind spot monitoring system that stops you dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another driver. And either standard or optional on top models is what Peugeot calls its driver assistance pack, inclusive of three key safety features. 
Dynamic cruise control uses a radar to constantly keep you a safe distance behind the car in front on the highway, while an emergency collision alert system will constantly scan the road ahead of you for potential accident hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, an emergency collision braking system will automatically apply braking for you to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. If the worst should happen and you've specified the Connect SOS and Assistance setup, you'll be especially well protected. It'll sense any accident and automatically alert the emergency services, giving them your exact GPS location. Could be a lifesaver. All the usual efficiency initiatives have been taken up in the creation of this car. The electric power steering, the wind cheating shape with its sleek 0.28 CD drag factor and the ultra low rolling resistance tyres offer up just a few examples. Even the LED headlamps you get on plusher models play their part, consuming 50% less energy than conventional halogen lamps. As with any fresh design though, the biggest gains in this respect come with a reduction in weight, which is why this Peugeot was a significant 140 kilograms lighter than its predecessor. That's equivalent to the weight of a couple of adults. Over half of the total weight saving has been made thanks to the use of aluminium and various composites in the high-tech EMP2 platform this car sits upon, with further gains made through things like a tailgate crafted from thermoplastic. These are just a few of the key reasons why the versions of this car with Peugeot's newer engines enjoy a small but significant cost of ownership advantage over most of their rivals in the focus-sized compact estate segment. Efficiency headlines here are dominated by one variant in particular, the 1.6 litre blue HDI diesel model that I'm trying here. This 120 brake horsepower diesel 308 gets the company's latest Euro 6 technology to eliminate 90% of NOx emissions and virtually all harmful diesel particulates. More relevant to many will be the fact that at the wheel of this car, Peugeot claim you'll be able to manage 85.6 miles from every gallon of diesel on the combined cycle, along with CO2 emissions of a mere 88 grams per kilometre. That kind of showing is good enough to take this car ahead of high-tech petrol-electric hybrid rivals, say Toyota's Auris Touring Sports Hybrid Estate model, for example. Back in the 308 SW range, I should also mention that there's a Pokia 150 brake horsepower 2-litre version of this blue HDI unit, but here the returns fall to 70.6 miles to the gallon and 105 grams per kilometre. The only problem with the blue HDI engines is that the technology they use is still a little on the pricey side. This is the reason why many 308 SW customers may prefer to opt for the older HDI and EHDI 1.6 litre diesel units carried across from the previous model lineup, which are still pretty efficient. Whether you go for the base 92 brake horsepower 1.6 HDI or the 115 brake horsepower 1.6 EHDI variant, you can expect to combine cycle fuel showing in the region of around 75 miles to the gallon and a CO2 return of as little as 100 grams per kilometre, which is well up to class standards. Most models get a stop and start system that, as usual with setups of this sort, cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Should your lower annual mileage lead you to plump for petrol power, then you should be impressed by the figures returned by the PureTech 1.2 litre ETHP engines on offer here. I'd choose the 110 brake horsepower unit, which manages 58.8 miles to the gallon and 111 grams per kilometre. Returns that fall only marginally to 56.5 miles to the gallon and 115 grams per kilometre if you order the same engine with 130 brake horsepower. So you can't go far wrong with a petrol 308 SW model, or at least you can't provided you're not one of the very few buyers considering the top of the range GT variant with its potent 205 brake horsepower 1.6 litre THP turbo engine. Here you'd be looking at 48.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 134 grams per kilometre of CO2. What else 
Well, the three year 60,000 mile warranty isn't as good as some other rivals, but at least insurance groupings should be competitive. To give you a few examples, the base 1.2 ETHP 110 petrol variant is rated at Group 13E, with the 130 brake horsepower model pitched at either 14 or 15E. Go diesel and the 1.6 HDI 92 variant comes in at Group 15, while the EHDI model is rated at Group 18. If you can stretch to the preferable 1.6 litre blue HDI 120 diesel version I'm trying here, you're looking at Group 20 or 21E. And the 2 litre blue HDI variant is Group 24 or 25E. Maintenance costs should certainly be lower than this car's predecessor, 22% more affordable than before thanks to longer service intervals and value orientated parts pricing. Redesigned brakes are said to offer 40% better brake pad life, while careful control of wheel toe-in is supposed to give 20% better tyre longevity. Very little helps, you see. Taxation? Well, go for this blue HDI 120 model and you can expect your benefiting kind rating to be the lowest of any compact estate car that you could have chosen in this market segment. As for residual values, well, no, you can't expect these to be up to Volkswagen Golf Estate standards, but Peugeot is certainly getting there. Independent industry experts CAP go as far as to call this 308 a game changer in this respect. Independent assessments suggest that a uh, second generation diesel 308 SW will be worth nearly £1,500 more after three years and 60,000 miles than the value its predecessor would have managed. For a petrol powered model, the figure rises to £1,600 over the same period. A unique selling point. Peugeot has always been determined that its compact estate models should have one. With the old 307SW and first generation 308SW models, that was offered by the option of third row seating. Here though, the emphasis has switched from people to packages, with a luggage bay that's quite simply of an astonishing size for this class of car. You don't realise that by looking at the thing, because the styling doesn't suggest predictable practicality. But then there's nothing that's really predictable about this car. Take for example the way that in ETHP petrol powered form, this prodigious load lugger can return almost 60 miles to the gallon and put out only 111 grams per kilometre of CO2 or blue HDI technology that could see you getting over 85 miles to the gallon and putting out as little as 88 grams per kilometre of CO2. Almost wherever you look, the surprises keep on coming. Which is not to suggest this car to be faultless. It doesn't offer the most dynamic drive in the segment, though it does deliver one of the more comfortable ones. And the infotainment touchscreen system can occasionally be a little frustrating to use. These two issues apart though, there really isn't a lot wrong with this 308 SW. It's a very well thought out product indeed. Primarily that's because it's been thoroughly developed as a purpose designed estate car. The properly lengthened wheelbase necessary for that, something of a rarity in a segment where this kind of body style is usually nothing more than a different derivative. Another box ticked for completion of a model range. Peugeot doesn't think of estate models in that way, prioritising them and the needs of their buyers. That's one reason why since the arrival of the company's 304 model back in 1969, every generation of the brand's 300 series has included a successful estate version. Expect more of the same here.